There was no chance of this being a short and easy video. None. I'm just gonna talk about everything. I don't care. What's good, y'all? Your main man, Master Cell, leader of the Master Knights of the Round Table of Company One. Subscribe to the Spin Booth. And we're here with Delicious in Dungeon, episode 17. So, something that I actually thought about just now. When it comes to Delicious in Dungeon, because this season just took about a week for most of the shows I'm watching to actually start, as well as Delicious in Dungeon not taking any breaks after the winter season was done, we're actually at the halfway point of the second part right now. And because there was zero chance of this show having a beach episode, we have to see that as a point where there would be a turning point in the second part in the second launch of the 12 episodes anyways. So in hindsight, something like this, I want to say had to happen, but shouldn't it be too surprising that it happened. But this came by so quick, so swift that I, I, I can, I, 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 honestly, I just wasn't ready for it. Even again, in hindsight, that we pretty much used revival magic on almost everybody, pretty much brought everybody back, still. And that comes off the heels of me straight up saying, I will tell y'all right now, when it came to following last week, when we seen her at the end of the episode, I really thought that was actually just kind of a check up on how she was. It showed us that she was mid-dragon, mid-turning into a chicken, mid-all that, and pretty much, I honestly just looked at that scene, that the way that she is progressing and returning into a dragon form, and honestly, that would have been it. I didn't see that as a foreshadow of what's going to happen next episode. No, I did not see Fallon coming through and wrecking everyone. But even before Fallon shows up, we get back to Shiro and Laos. Laos, I bet. Laos still with the sword to his neck. Pretty much Shiro is like, you know what? Hell no. We agreed that he wasn't exactly going to join the crew, but I at least thought that some kind of alliance could have been made here. That did not happen. I was wrong a lot this week. Matter of fact, Sure was ready to snitch. Ain't supposed to be using dark magic. I think Kabu comes through and be like, you ain't supposed to be using dark magic. That's an ultimate taboo. Matter of fact, he would better off leaving her dead. Sure tells him to shut his little ass up. Kabu only said that because that's the most logical here, but he knows also Sure probably would have made the same decision that Fallen did. Excuse me, my bad. <laughs> he would have made the same decision as Marcel did. Seeing because if Marcel feels any way about Fallen, very possibly Sure feels the strongest about her out of everybody because he's actually in love with her. I would call out the brotherly love between <laughs> Leos and Fallen, but even Leos had some shots I got to run in this episode. Shouldn't you just sitting there watching the entire time, saying nothing? He always got zero lines in this episode. But still, even with everything going on and the feelings going on here, Shiro is still more focused on what actually happened. Meaning he's still on board with pretty much turning Marcel over to the West Elves. <laughs> Figuring out what's going on with the dark magic, coming back here, and pretty much trying to at least give Fallen a chance to rest in peace. As far as we know, even with his feelings for Fallen, Shiro believes he's already gone. However, why think that when you can see it for yourself? But that before Shilshuk runs in here and tells us that the Heartbeats are attacking. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have officially moved, or upgraded rather, to Yu-Gi-Oh monsters. At least they didn't bring the pet dragon. Oh, hell, they did. It's just freaking Yu-Gi-Oh now. It is. This is Duel Monsters. Y'all know I'm at least gonna bring it up so let me at least go into the back room. Yes, nigga. Yes, bitch. Yes, motherfucker. The Harpies had nipples. Coming them screeching all crazy, just catching me off guard right down there. It was too early for this. It's too early in the morning for this. Despite those singing creatures with ha hair censored over their titties, despite Fallen having a bloody nipple on the on display on some killer kill trigger shit, which is where we are, we have officially upgraded to just titties on display. These harpies had them things dangling, even though there was never actually a close up. Most of these titties that we seen was pretty much from the distance, so I guess that's their way of getting away with it. Even though this is Netflix, I mean, you don't necessarily need a reason. <laughs> and these nipples was very distinctive. They're kind of like the OG nipples, more darker pink nipples than you typically see nowadays in animes that actually feature nipples. Some old school nipples for that ass. There, it was. I'm going back now. And these harpies are already offering people, like pretty much Shiro's and family. And we're trying to fight back against these harpies, but honestly, let's just keep a buck 50. That's not what's important here. But if it's a power play by Trigger, or rather the, the creator or the writer for Delicious and Dungeon, everything here that you can almost think of at the moment caught you off guard. One, flying nipples, soaring titties. Two, all of a sudden, just out of the blue, out of nowhere, people, members of Shiro's family, his girls, is getting off. And three, the way it happened, it started off screen, and Shilcha came in here and said, we gotta get some things done. Who then also found out that Leos told everybody everything, pretty much. Can you really call Shiro a snitch when you're homies or informants? But this scene with the Harpy happened rather quick, or was not even over rather quick, because the person that ended up taking the Harpies out, as we know if we watch this episode, was Fallen. 
Fallen straight up showed up out of nowhere as Ezra Moga. I can't freaking say it. Ultra Mega Chicken. Of course, we know what it's going for over time, but the only thing that connects her to a dragon right now is it's possibly his wings in the back and his red feet. She came in here as Ultra Mega Chicken, y'all. And I'm not talking about the Yu Gi Oh! at Bridge meme, even though this is obviously Yu Gi Oh! monsters now. I'm talking about the freaking big chicken that showed up out of nowhere in Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Fuck you. This, this, this was not the time, bruh. Fallen just ran away taking out some of the harpies, not all of them. Presumably, out of A, just got the bloodlust, or B, move these holes out the way so she can fight to prove herself. Now, obviously, we know that Fallen is still under control. Control from the dark health. Even casting some spells out of nowhere, even saying some weird language to casting some of these spells, even though we, I thought she didn't need to cast these spells or these languages anymore, as we've seen that she's protected everybody a few episodes ago when she ran with that spell that saved Senshi's life. It was the same scene as the debut of Bloomers, by the way. And the first shot at Laos, Laos, this man, comes here because when Fallen comes out of nowhere, everybody gets a good look at Fallen and get a good look at what's going on. His first thought is how cool she looks. Follow up with It's Not Fair. I kind of wanted to save this discussion about near the end, but I guess I'll start a little bit of it now. Lyle's issues with Shiro. Or rather, Shiro's issues with Lyle's. Shiro does not like Lyle's. He don't. He sees Lyle's as annoying. He sees him as incompetent. And, you know, he, he brought up moments where he was happily, happily just talking about everything he was doing. Pretty much how, like, hey, we've been eating monsters. Hey, we've been going to the dungeon. By the way, we beat the dragon and doing magic. The way he just nonchalantly just talks about everything, how it's kind of just doesn't mean much, and he's kind of just talking just to be talking. Something, of course, that we have seen plenty of times, most notably was halfway through the part one where he was talking about, hey, it's a good thing that Fallen got eaten by that dragon so we can have this meal. Yeah, I bet you take that shit back now after seeing this episode, nigga. But these sides of the complaints is something that I would say is at least shared with a collective part of the audience, a, a collective part that I am involved in. You gotta be kidding. Like, your sister showed up here as Ultra Mega Chicken is halfway fused with the red dragon that you got used to revive her in the first place with a dead look on her face. And the first thing you say is how cool she looks. Anyways, honestly, not much point in actually going through the play by play, but finally damn near kills everyone. First and foremost, Shiro's sisters are just simply fucked. And as this thing goes on, you look at this from its lens, it's like, are we killing, I guess, this, no disrespect intended, but the, I guess the lesser known members of these guys' crews? Cause we were just introduced in the Shiro's family in the beginning and honestly the first members of her family that got killed I didn't even know their names or recollected who they were from last week. Actually let's go one further than that, I don't remember the older sister that was cooking us the meal. Now, even the more thicker girl that was running around with the horns, I, I, I didn't even recognize her from last week. But she was the last one to die besides Shiro. But when finally starts having to cast spells to take on Kabu's crew, things get a little bit more crazy. First they had to take out the dog, of course. And there's another guy that was a small guy running around the new healing magic and revival magic right now, but he kind of just stayed in tuck the whole time, which was good, because that's how we got back. But the attacks on these members of these two crews right now shows how actually gory this show can also get. This is brutal killings, like, finally gives no fucks right now, and this blood is being spilled everywhere. As I say again, it's, it was too early in the morning for this. This ain't something that the average Delicious and Dungeon fan should be like, if you wake up and you ain't gotta go to work in the morning and that work, you go into the kitchen, get your morning coffee, sipping on this stuff, maybe open your phone, maybe open the TV app looking at this episode and this is what, this is how you start your day. Or you're at work early morning watching this episode, things are slow and all of a sudden this, this comes out of nowhere blowing your mind and then it just ruins your productivity. You know something Delicious and Dungeon? You bastard. And of course the turning point in the fight is when Leos gets involved and he's thinking about how Kim's game was running away. But, you know, he just called him just a monster at the end of the day during the fight with the Red Dragon. Now, now he's looking at Fallen and it's kind of like, decisions has to be made. And he actually is all of a sudden leading more so towards taking out Fallen. And as we see in the montage in the back, we come to find after this scene during that montage that actually Shinji is apparently still dealing with the Harpies. Because mind you, Fallen doesn't take out all the Harpies. But you can imagine Shieldstruck who can't necessarily fight like that anyways and Basile not really doing much right now. Kind of watching on in horror at the same time telling them don't want that to kill Fallon. However, everybody else is being off. And you know the person I'm about to talk about right now. But however, you, you gotta look at this from that type of perspective. It's like, Lyle's crew isn't being killed. Lyle, Shinchi, Marcel, and Shilchuk ain't the one on full blast right now. Even if you want to add Shiro to that just for old time's sake. Everybody else is. 
And maybe you could say that because they're actually trying to fight back or the fact that they're moving in the front of a monster stand just standing still so she can't see him. Blah, blah, blah. Like, the position never ends right now. Team Lyos is the last people to listen to. So when Lyos is right in front of Fallon, thinking that he might have to take the kill but shot himself, when Lyos, when Fallon just starts talking to Lyos out of nowhere, t- saying, t- asking her brother to help him, which is cliche as hell and everybody's all coming. Just be real with it. Lyos then backs down as Lyos picks up that, I mean, as Fallon tricks herself back up. But Kabu just show up right behind her and go for the fatal shots. All four of them, neck, chest, stomach, kidneys. That shit actually kind of hurt. <laughs> and attempt to just quickly kill Fallon. However, that will work on the human, which I can't even blame her for because the top half is still Fallon. The top half is still human, at least, at least as we can tell with that big ass shirt on. God damn. Well, I, I, I told you I was going to tell you everything I was thinking, right? Remember that basket chicken thing with the chicken's ass and the snake's head? I'm not sure Fallon is turning into a dragon. This girl got a chicken ass. Leo's did this is cool. <laughs> this may go without saying, but I would not wish this on people. So whoever has wronged me in life and done whatever to me in life, just know this. I do not wish for you to become a dragon. With that being said, Fallon throws copper off of her and no, that did not take her out. And as everybody looks even more concerned over Fallon, the rest is looking cons- confused how she ain't dead. She then starts to rip off her shirt, which has Marcio be acting. I'm not about to throw any Yuri jokes at Marcio this episode, yo. I think of any longtime friend of yours who sits from having to be females, all of a sudden exposing herself, I think anybody would just be like, wait, hold on. Just in case you're watching this video and you're incel, no, it's not okay for your friend, female friends to have titties on display. Let her get it how she lives, but it's your responsibility. That's her friend, so let her know. However, Fallon is not a harpy, and apparently the, first, the top half of her titties is already covered in whatever this sh- chicken thing that's going on. Fallon is the actual on-screen main character. You can't have Fallen nipples on this play. It, it, it's too much. At least not right now. Maybe it, you gotta upgrade. If you ask me, no. They shouldn't, it shouldn't really happen. It really shouldn't, no. But if it's gonna happen, it's too soon right now. This is not the time. Wasn't Fallon's huge bath scene, bloody butt crack, bloody nipples, and white bloomers enough? Thirsty ass niggas. And then, once again, if one last time it can happen, we get another tone shift. Leos tries to go help Kabu out, but Fallon's still on the attack. But Leos gets moved and pushed out the way, but Kabu is killed. Straight up stepped on by Fallon. Actually off screen. We've seen the scene where Leos gets pushed out the way. We look back over there and then see Kabu is crushed. That was some slick disrespect, my guy. Kabu came back out of nowhere and tried to kill Fallon from behind with the four fatal shots. Colin, not Colin. Fallon did not. She, she didn't like that. She disrespected this man, Kabu, with that death. And this is followed up with Fallon vindictive ass, taking out almost the rest of Kabu's crew. Even Ren, dog. Even Ren. Ren goes for this huge spell out of nowhere that has everything kind of just flying, including her dress, but you know, she has that shadow sensory underneath it. I think I might be wrong. I don't know if she wears bloomers. I actually don't think she does. She probably do though. Regular panties in this show would be weird at this point. Now, if we just fast forward, really what ends up happening is one huge final attack from Fallen that causes the ground to break like the one big ass spell because now the ground is coming up but it's spiky parts is coming out of the ground, which actually ends up killing Ren. Fallen protects Chilchuck and Chiro. Ayos is out of the way and I, I don't know the name of the mage of Kabu's group. But after this, Fallen is now gone. But there's the only people left right now is indeed Team Team Leos and the revival guy and Shiro. With all due respect, the characters evolve, even some characters that had their big moments in their own episodes. Unless you're Shiro, who has passed because he was part of the main characters well, at one time, you are the main characters, or you're literally the one guy left that Shiro is going to actually trust to revive people back because he doesn't trust Marcio. It wasn't important enough. Outside the main crew right now, and the one other person they still need, you was killed. Brutal deaths, bruh. Painful. Quick, but painful. Then again, in a world where you don't hear the shot that takes you down, but even that pain. Well, I don't know, man. I really don't. I never died before, right? I said this was going to be a long video, anyways, but I'm actually going to speed things up. Yes, at the end of the day, all, lot, all things considered, everybody does pretty much get revived. And actually, not, not completely true earlier, everybody didn't actually die. Some people are just very much wounded, and they allowed Marcel to help with the healing magic rather than revival magic. The first person brought back to life was, of course, Kapu, because he's the head man of the team that the revival guy is on. The second person they brought back to life is uh, Shiro's older sister, the only actual perfect member of that group besides Shiro's. <laughs> Eventually, they revived Ren. Everybody else also pretty much could revive, like the dog. 
Marcia heals everybody who needs to be healed. Shinshi in this montage is still fighting harpies. But of course, this is delicious a dungeon, so we know why Shinji went back after the harpies. It had nothing to do with titties and nipples. He was looking at the ass. Again, more on that later. Despite all the craziness in this episode, it's time to get to the part and go over it. Honestly, the part of it that actually has my biggest critique. Now, if we blah 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 things and get to the point where Lyos and Shiro had their fight. All these considered, I don't even find it necessary. Maybe it's necessary between these two to get things out there, get things out the way, blah blah blah, and untucked feelings here and there, but not necessarily for us to have, have to watch it. And here's why. Because Shiro, he long story short, he never liked Laos, right? He was fed up with Laos, and he did show a little couple of montages of Laos getting in his way, Laos talking too much, over talking, pretty much also adding himself kind of in a third wheel thing whenever Shiro had a chance with Fallon. And Laos, he pretty much just like, he, Shiro was the first friend that he made on this island, which I guess your prior friendship to Marcel didn't mean to. And when you make a friend for the first time, you kind of want to express yourself to that friend, talk about things you like, blah, blah, blah. You know, pretty much the arguments that we made last yesterday were viral hit. And even I would agree that at some point, freaking Laos was spitting some facts, or at least some viewpoints that I stand on. If it was really that big of a problem you had with me, why well, didn't you just say the problem you had then and there? And why are you bringing this up now at the worst possible time just because you're pissed off at something and you know you want to just be pissed off at me when I'm not even the problem yet? Like, I get it. But the issue I have here is it changes the dynamic and it changes the reason why Shiro should be mad at Lyos. All the legitimacies that you brought up it kind of matches some of the audience that had feeling on Lyos in the first place. How he kind of just knocks a lot about everything he does. How he kind of just over, overlooks everything that's going on right now for the sake of the monsters. How he kind of just neglects what actually happening with Fallon because of these state of fascinations. His position as a leader, his incompetence as a leader sometimes, and all the critiques we've been giving Lyos for the past 17 weeks. But instead he goes into all this petty shit that we didn't see first and foremost because we never saw a backstory between you two that we don't really necessarily have time or reason to care about because again, Seth Fallon just came through off to everybody. We just provided everybody and now we need to do our next move. But instead you're fighting over Laos over some petty shit that you should have brought up the first time and this fight shouldn't even happen in the first place because all your critiques that you have on Laos one's critique you have on Laos that he can not put out there with immaturity. And even if you disagree with that, that is straight up Shuro right now. This fight between them two here didn't do anything for me, even with as strong as nice, nice that uppercut was that he gave to Laos. That was one of the wow we're really doing this moments of this show. And those moments in the show are supposed to be preoccupied by some random feast be feasts for half of the bosses. At least Dan goes into what this show is. This was dumb. You wanna fight Laos because you never liked Laos. Your whole crew just got killed by Fallen, dude. The bitch you're in love with? Sure was in Laos eventually do sit down because the other montage I was talking about with vibing everybody and Shinji essentially preparing the meal. They was fighting with all that was going on, so it really no telling how long that fight really was. But they eventually sat down afterwards and continued to talk. And Shiro, you know, he apparently proposed to Fallon, but without actually telling Fallon how he felt. I'm not saying I'm in love with you. I'm not saying it's like that. But will you marry me? You know what? I don't like Shiro. I don't. If this man who barely eats any dick and barely says any dick and doesn't have a reason to have a mouth ends up taking his ass out of the dungeon, that's it for him and the rest of the show, I don't think I have a problem with that. We come to find a fallen and give him an answer, and at this point he doesn't believe he ever's gonna get one. However, Leos tells him that the next time he sees Fallon, he's gonna let him know. Actually, if I can get one joke, for all the people who does ship Fallon with said Marcel, I would prefer that. The heart wants what the heart wants, but sure didn't earn no love from Fallon. He ain't. Now there is Carbu, you know, old sneak ass. He's still thinking about the possibilities going on with Lyos in this dungeon. Because Lyos does straight up say his plan in all this, to solve all this, is simply to defeat the Mad Mage. Which upon first hearing is simply outlandish, but he, nobody else has a plan at all. It's one of those situations where it's like, there's no way in hell you can do that. Okay, so what can we do? She was still going to snitch. Straight up telling them that he's telling everybody. He's, <laughs> he's telling the powers that be. Like, you guys not getting out of this. When this show is officially all said and done, you guys probably will face trial. I don't, I don't know how, I, I, I don't know if it happened. Anything is a, is a thing right now. However, Carbon mentally says whoever defeats the Mad Mage pretty much controls the country. So, rewrite the laws? As well as own the dungeon. He wonder what Lyos would do with said dungeon. This is a topic that has been brought up before. Eventually, that discussion is going to need to be had. Eventually. But in the meantime, it's time for a meal. Eggs. Omelets, 
Shang Chi was after the Harpy's eggs, and th that's what we eat. But even a moment like this, moment that we're so very much used to, even with the moment, first reaction to these meals, as Carbu has had, saying he probably want to kill Leo, so he's just gonna have to eat this. We see again the very much possibility of this man's just simple ulterior motives. Even in this moment, after everything that's happened, even trying to do your typical delicious dungeon shtick about eating some monsters, the reason Kaibu went ahead and ate these eggs is to stay on Leo's good side. Something that is mentally pointed out by every member of his crew. And I don't even believe that his crew honestly know what's happening for real for real with, with Kaibu. They just know something is going on, as well as the rest of us. By us, I mean the obvious. obvious. I was going to say the obvious, but obviously to people like Leo, it's obviously not. After this meal, long story short, Shura and his, his family does leave to snitch on us. And Kabu's team leaves as well, saying that they confirming that they will be again with a sly look on his face that at this point, honestly, I want to punch him. <laughs> and then we see Team Leo's walks off, but this is very much comparable to the scene that we got a few episodes ago, right after we seen the episode with Kabu's crew, where we realized that Team Leo's all the whole time was on the verge of death. But that's not the case because they just had a meal and they all kind of freshened up now. Everybody's revived and healed. The tone right here, especially with Marcel's apology, it, 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 it's rather dark. They're kind of just walking off right now, even with the intentions of eventually being the Mad Mage. No, their original plan to leave the dungeon and freshen up is not going to happen. They had to mention knowing that we have to still beat the Dark Elf and there's a wild fallen out there ready to kill us and just pretty much itching for, at this point, round four. Right now, when it comes to fights with the Red Dragon, it's 2 1. Not to mention, knowing that we're going to get snitched on in the first place, and being told that everything that she did was absolutely taboo for the entirety of this episode, Rusty Seal's spirit just looked crushed. And then it says then, once again, at the end of everything, how much of a doozy this episode was. I'm usually against episode reviews, it's actually the length of the freaking episode itself, but Jesus Christ. It always makes you think in hindsight, how about this episode even 24 minutes? However, with that being said, let's call it here. This is one of my most reactionary two episodes ever, because honestly, I don't even know what, how, what to think of this. I can't even make the bold ass statement to tell you this was a good episode. I'm gonna spend the rest of the day sitting on this episode now. If you watch this video, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Like this video for me, and I'll see y'all. Peace out, subscribe to the spin move. Mm -hmm.